Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. On behalf of the Navarro College Board of Trustees, our chairman, Phil Judson, Vice Chairman Todd McGraw, Secretary Treasurer Richard Aldama, Trustees Buster Atkinson, Trustee who's with us today, Faith Holt. It's always important for you to applaud for my bosses. <laughs> trustee Lauren Seeley and Trustee Kim Wyatt, our outstanding faculty and staff we have throughout our entire district, and most importantly, our Navarro College alumni and students, we thank you for allowing us to host this event today. We are very honored to have this opportunity. At Navarro College, our history, tradition, legacy, and values are referred to as Bulldog Pride. And it's a theme that has been developed over the 75 years of Navarro College's history. But what's most important in developing that history, those traditions, legacy, and values is that we honor a very important word. I share with our trustees and my colleagues all the time, there's a reason why the first word in community colleges is community. That's our number one priority as a community college, to effectively serve our community, our communities that we represent. For us to be there for you, for us to ensure you have the resources that we may be able to provide for you to utilize, for us to be the very best partner that we can be for you. Notice I never said the word us. It's about you. It's about our community, how we best partner with you. Events and opportunities like this allow us to do that. So again, we are very honored to have you here today. And I would like to now introduce to deliver our invocation, the Reverend Derry Johnson. Thank you, Dr. Fagan. Let us pray. Gracious and loving Father, we thank you again for this Hour, we thank you for the legacy of George Washington Jackson, his precious memories as young men who braced the hall of Jackson High School. That was a slogan that I'm reminded in our yearbook, Unborn Millions That Will Travel and Walk Through the Hallways of Jackson High School. And we thank you for the leadership of Ms. Chance, uh, given direction on this program and this project. May it be for your glory and your honor. We thank you for blessing us and for the food that has been shared for the nourishing strength of our bodies. And Lord, we thank you uh, not only, but we want you uh, to uh, touch and heal a special young man that has been given instruction, uh, Brother Richard Ballard. We ask that you would touch his body, his family, give him the strength because we know that you're a healer and you are a deliverer. And so we thank you for your precious name because at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that you are the Lord of Lord and you are the kings of kings. Now we ask your blessing to be with us throughout this service. For this we do pray. We ask it in your wonderful name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Gwen Johnson Chance, president and one of several founders of the G.W. Jackson Multicultural Society. And I'd like to thank Dr. Fagan and also Reverend Derry Johnson. Dr. Fagan for his warm and inviting welcome and his vision of sharing his vision of the Bulldog Pride, which uh, is real familiar to me because I graduated from Booger T. Washington High School in Dallas and we were Bulldog Pride, <laughs> proud. Uh, 
and Reverend uh, Johnson for the prayers of blessing for this event this day. On behalf of our governing board and advisory board, I appreciate you both and your warm hospitality and the use of this beautiful space. Also, I am ex so excited and overwhelmed with the attendance and want to say thanks to each and every one of you for joining us to help celebrate the very first celebration of a legacy, George Washington Jackson, on his 167th birthday and 81 years since his death. Thank you. Every great dream begins with a dreamer. Always remember, you have within you the strength, the patience, and the passion to reach for the stars to change the world." Unquote. Harriet Tutman's quote represents the vision that started this project by Mrs. Lois Jean Johnson Hart, now deceased. My oldest sister was a former student of Mr. George Washington Jackson, AKA GW, in the 30s. She, he was her model, and evidently by her later success upon the world, and by her uh, success upon the world, Mrs. Hart recognized the impact and importance of his legacy, and was apparent through the many prominent former students who went on to leave a positive mark on the community and the world just as he did. Likewise, I would like to share the profound words from Mr. G.W. Jackson that so represented his leadership, character, and dedication to the education of his students for the betterment of the community. Quote, I have not known, I have not grown rich in this world's goods while I have served my people, but I enjoyed a great satisfaction in the thought that I leave the principalship of the school in the confidence of my older, old students, parents, and citizens of Corsicana. Everything that was learned about this man in recent years point to his success as an educator and many other things as you will learn today or hear today uh, from Reverend Max Maxwell. Phil, <laughs> I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. We have placed handouts with information on our major 2021 uh, fundraising and marketing activities for each of you to read consider a level of support and donate to the Legacy Park in his honor. We hope that you will consider supporting one of the levels outlined in the materials, starting with the brick in, his name, in your name. Remember, it takes a village. It takes a village to make anything and all things successful. We need your support. The project's vision for the Legacy Park is to create community collaborations and capturing the rich history and legacy of the African-American experience as a vital part of the experience of all Americans and will be designated a tourist attraction. It will be a true sense of place for the society's homage to its namesake, George Washington Jackson, the first African-American school principal in Corsicana. Now, it is my privilege to share with you Mr. George Washington Jackson's sculpture, History in the Making, by Mr. Spencer Evans, a professor at the Rhode Island School of Design. This will be the very first and special sculpture of an African-American in Corsicana. Would you share the video now? So we're putting... And I think just before I introduce why we're all here today, I would like to ask all students who graduated or were part of the G.W. Jackson 
Dunbar, which I know there are none here, but G.W. Jackson High School to please stand up. We'd like to welcome you and say thank you for giving us Mr. Jackson. Okay. I have to say uh, the agenda has Maxwell on there as many times as I've talked to Reverend Maxfield as many times as he's corrected me, so I'm gonna assume that I made the mistake since we didn't get a chance to look at the uh, agenda before it was printed this morning. But it is my pleasure to have the opportunity to get to know the Reverend Ron Maxwell over several months now in preparation for his presentation today. He was born in Corsicana, if there are anyone here that doesn't know that, and graduated from Corsicana High School in 1975, so he darn sure should know what he's talking about. His, he, uh, he graduated, uh, his graduate work was from Baylor University and the Southwestern Theological Seminary. He is the pastor at the First Baptist Church in Marlow, Oklahoma. Reverend Maxwell is a licensed social, and is a licensed social worker. He is married and has two adult sons. Reverend Maxwell writes, and I quote, I have, done, I have been doing this historical mini tours of Corsicana as it appears before World War I. In other words, his, his replicas go back that far. Some of you have seen and are familiar with his mini tour structures, dioramas, of Corsicana's historic buildings. I looked up the definition of a diorama and would like to share with those who may not know what it is. According to Webster's Dictionary, a diorama is a three-dimensional replica or scale model of a landscape uh, that's rich in history, typically showing historical events. I am pleased that you will hear and learn some exciting history today. So without further ado, I can't wait to hear and learn from Reverend Maxwell as I am certain that each of you are. And I'd like to thank you so much for being here with us and sharing today. Reverend Maxwell. <laughs> Well, I am honored to be here today. Uh, I said I am a native of this area. I've been living in Oklahoma for a while now. I am a pastor, so as you know, when you put a watch or a phone up on the podium, that means absolutely nothing if you're a pastor. So I'm going to try. I have a lot of material to cover, and it's going to be difficult to kind of hold it down to uh, uh, an hour. Or so, well, I'll do my very best. I'll do my very best. So, um, oh, let me get my notes here. That always helps to have your notes. So uh, I can cite a time that happened. It was about 30 years ago. I was speaking to the Navarro Historical Society. It was over in the Temple Bethel Synagogue where that meeting was taking place. I had just begun my first miniature, and there was a lady in the back of the room, and her last name was Hart. <clears throat> and as I was talking about the miniatures, Ms. Hart said, do you have anything going on to build for the east side of Corsicana? And I said, well, outside of the school, I don't know what else I can really build. And he said, oh, there's a lot of things to build over there. So that was her. And she reminded me of that as I did my research. I found there were a lot of things to build and a lot of things to do with history. So a little bit about the history on what I'm calling here Northeast Corsicana. Now, there is very little um, documented as far as what is written in the early parts as far as between 1865 to 1881, but we do know that um, the greatest document, documentation of the early history is through the churches. And basically through communities, that's really where all documentation starts, through the churches. So we have a very detailed history of the Baptist and Methodist Church of Northeast Corsicana, which does take us back to about 1865. So that's our first part that we have that is well documented. So those are our best histories. 
And those histories give good detail, but we have nothing as far as knowing where the first residences were other than we know where the churches are typically planted and where the schooling typically begins, that's where your residential district begins. So as we go on, I'm going to pop this up here, see if it works. It does. This is what I would call the real first part of the heart of the black community of Corsicana. This comes from a bird's eye view drawing from 1886, which the complete drawing is over here on this easel. But this is a, a blow up of it. And I'm going to use my little pointer thing. There we go, a little laser pointer. And show you some of these areas. Now this would be Fifth Street right here. This right here would be uh, what is now Jackson Street. Right here, this would be Second Baptist Church, as it was called at that time, 1886. But later it moved over to this corner and then became in 1917 the uh, first independent Baptist church, which is there today. Also, this church right here is Bethel AME Church, which is on the same corner. Yeah, same corner, but you see that the structure is different. But then uh, later on, by the turn of the century, it moved down to the very corner of the block. But it began in the center of the block. This building over here, I'm going to talk more about later on, about that and the family. This was later to become known as Samuel J. Chestnut's Grocery. And I'm going to get to that a little bit later because that is a piece of history I'm still researching and would love to find more information on. So from that, these are the high points of this part. You'll see these two churches, the grocery store, and you see all the residences around in this area. So this is how it all begins. I was told, and this is just what I'm saying, some of these things are documented, some of them are come legend. I don't know which parts of these are really true. I was told years ago from a resident over at Northeast Corsicana that, well, this part's true, we know, is that there was a black garrison that was stationed here during the time of Reconstruction in Corsicana. The legend has it that some of those soldiers stayed in Corsicana and may have had a part in establishing the first residential district. I don't know that for sure. This was given to me firsthand by a resident. So I don't know if that, but we know for sure that that area, this is where it began, is right here in this part of town. Our first documentation, though we get very little photographic documentation of it, uh, we do know that by 1882, we get some of our very first documents. Uh, personally, I'd love to find more about who the original residents were, the, the original families and so forth. And I did mention the 1886 bird's eye view. But as we move on, we find this gentleman here. This gentleman is really responsible for giving us most of the early documentation of the early history. Uh, the earliest drawings of a structure from the early time period was the Brick School Building, commissioned in 1881. I have a copy of that on the table over there. Before this time, the school was taught in the churches, sometimes the Methodists, sometimes the Baptists, according to G.W. Jackson. In fact, it seems the first real documented history of Corsicana's community was through G.W. Jackson. Now, this was the first school building. Well, now, we do pay a lot of homage to him. I'll refer to him mostly as Professor Jackson. And Professor Jackson was a great educator, but I would go a step further from that of saying I believe he was also one of the leading civic figures of Corsicana. In fact, I would call him one of our city fathers. He truly was. His fingerprint was on everything that ever happened within the black community of Corsicana, especially from this era. The first thing to happen here would be the first school. And uh, it was typical. Of that, of that era. Um, there were uh, public schools began in 1881 as they were commissioned. And uh, they started out with the Collins Street School on the far east side of, uh, up far west side of town. And then they built this school to become later known as Fred Douglas School. Sometimes spelled with one S, sometimes not. You'll find in the later pictures of the building there was only one S on the name Douglas. So um, this name was taken in April of 1911. That's when it first happened. Typical early 19th century of those communities. It first takes the shape around those, those churches. As I've said earlier, go to the next picture there, is that when that building was designed, it actually was designed by an architect out of Waco. His name was W.W. W. Larmore. He designed the Fred Douglas building, and then two years later, he designed Baylor University. So the legacy of this building that you saw before came from the architect who built Baylor, and those buildings are still there today. So that's a great, great tie-in legacy. So North uh, East Corsicana um, was a combination of, of, those, of those two architectural styles. 
Now, uh, so it's said that we cannot only, that not only had the first brick school in there, as known, uh, G. W. Jackson hints about this in a letter that he wrote in the newspaper in 1915, that it was probably the first brick school for a black community built in the state of Texas. So this was a, a first. And this is the miniature that I built of that building, as it, you see over on this other side here. And you see the top, it says public school, 1882. And then I said by 1911, it was given the name Fred Douglas. There were early school teachers of that day, were uh, Reverend W.W. W. Hay. He also taught, and, they was, and also Reverend Z.T. Pardee of the Baptist Church, also Reverend T.V.B. Davis of the Methodist Church, and local professor D. M. Hall were early teachers in 1881. G. W. Jackson was a student at Fisk University at the time, and he was hired, and the first teacher and principal of the public school in the northeast section of Corsicana. Now, professor Jackson was born in Alabama at Smith Station, Lee County. His father and mother, Reverend Anderson Jackson and Mother Clara Jackson. Professor Jackson first taught school in Russell County, Alabama, then in 1875 in Lee County, Alabama, 1876, and then he first appeared in Corsicana in 1877. So this begins the career within the county here in Nevada County. And as we begin getting all the early um, articles that he would write for the newspapers, this is the, the real uh, crux of the histories that we have now of uh, the, the black community of Corsicana. Taught the first school here at Wadeville near Kearns, and then he resigned that teaching position in 1880 to finish his schooling at Fisk and he was hired by Corsicana in 1881 and served one year, and then he left for one year to complete his degree temporarily, and it was covered by a friend of his, W.H. Scott. And when he returned the following year, he remained the school's principal for the next 43 years. A long, long history. So Miss Fanny L. Hall was his first assistant teacher. The second teacher was Miss Mary E. Stokes. She was a second assistant. And the first graduating class was 1889. It consisted of James Aldridge, Lily Alexander, and Celia Bragg. And this is who you see here. That is Celia Bragg. So she was of the first graduating class of the school where Professor Jackson was the principal. The second class to graduate was in 1892 and included Ernest Winters, who became a lawyer and a bookkeeper in the United States Treasury Department. All of this comes from a volume that Professor Jackson wrote back in 1915. Important to note that Professor Jackson was a disciple of Booker T. Washington. And to know Professor Jackson as an educator, one would have to read his book, and it was just called The Schoolroom Helps for Teachers and Parents. It was published in 1912. I have a copy of that. Uh, Fisk University was very gracious to copy that for me and send it to me, so I read through it. And if you look at that, I've also read the writings of Booker T. Washington. If you, if you didn't know the names at the bottom of the page, you would think it was the same person. They were, they were totally in sync when it came to their philosophy of education. So the books uh, written by Jackson and the books written also by Washington are very much the same. Uh, Professor Jackson began a program in 1905, and it was a program that began in Tuskegee University. And if you go over there and see that T-shirt, the reason I have Tuskegee there is there is a, large, there's a great tie between uh, Corsicana and Tuskegee. Uh, Professor Jackson being closely tied with Booker T. Washington. Washington started what he called the Tuskegee Method of Education in 1902. And then in 1905, Professor Washington began his program. Now, this is a picture that came from one of the early Jackson. I do not know who the lady is. I'm not only here to give you information, but if you have information to give me, please let me know. I don't know who the lady is. If that's a student or a teacher or his wife, I have no idea who that is. That is one of the earliest pictures I have of a G.W. Jackson during those days as a principal at the school. His first hire under that Tuskegee program was this lady here. Her name was Anna Ayers. She graduated in 1905 from Tuskegee University and came here to begin the program. She was um, later, and this is a little history on her, which gives a tie to Corsicana. She later married uh, Thomas Campbell, who was the Director of Agriculture at Tuskegee University. Uh, she was a nurse at the time. She left Corsicana to get her nursing degree. And they had a, a, this large family here, and I don't know which boy it is, but one of them there later on becomes Colonel William Campbell, one of the Tuskegee Airmen. 
So Corsicana has a tie to, the, to the Tuskegee Airmen. Also with the program, um, there was uh, another man named Edward Earl. Now he, Miss Ayers was from Tuskegee originally. Edward Earl was also, he was a Texas guy. He was born in Elderville, Texas. And uh, the, he, in this new education model, it was so popular to do the Tuskegee method that people from Dallas used to take the inner urban down to Corsicana to attend the Tuskegee method campus. So as what you see over there, if you notice there is the, the, the brick Douglas School building in the center of the campus, but all around it, the wooden buildings, those are all part of the Tuskegee Booker T. Washington campus that Professor Jackson built for that program. Uh, the new education model became so popular, again, that it drew people from all over the county, even as far as Dallas. The school had an excellent band program as well. Okay, where'd it go? Let's back up here. Next, there we go. That, uh, one of the things that uh, Ms. Ayers did is she started this program. It was called uh, the Domestic Science Program. And as you see, it was also funded by uh, James Garrity and Charles Allen. Uh, they donated each uh, $1,500 to the program, which in 1905 is a lot of money. And uh, they, along with many other supporters in Corsicana, helped get the Tuskegee program going. And the, the miniature, you see the miniature down there, that's the close-up of it. And that would be Miss Anna Ayers, the, the uh, one who started the domestic science program there. Also, there was a band program Go on next. We see that when they hired Edward Earl to be the teacher of the manual training shop. So he began the manual training shop. Now, Edward Earl was here for several years, up until I think at least until 1915, and was, uh, like I said, a graduate of Tuskegee University. They also had a great band here, excellent program. It was first taught by R.H. Hardy in 1910, known as one of the best bands in the state. Now, this isn't labeled as him, but I'm trying to track things down, even though it, the caption doesn't say that's who it is. I have a strong suspicion that's who this is. Uh, he was in the annual under the, 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 if you know differently, tell me, please. But I believe this is Mr. Hardy, who was the band director. This shows a picture of the first band. A lot of students. No girls, sorry girls, there's no girls at that time in the band. But Mr. Hardy started this band. And like I said, it was one of the, the best in the state. Uh, here we see the band hall, which is right there in front of the, the school. The way I found out where these places are is there is a, um, a map. It's called Sanborn Map Company. And they make uh, footprints of all the buildings and all the structures in town. And if you look in 1910, it shows the Douglas School surrounded by the wooden buildings. And they're all designated with their brick or wood shows the buildings, and they're all designated as School Building A, B, and C. Now, the Domestic Science Building is, actually has the label on it. It's named in the map. The rest of them are simply designated as classrooms, so I'm really doing educated guesses as to which is which. But I feel pretty confident that the manual training school was uh, correct because if you look on the map, it's a little bit away from the school building. And I think one of the reasons with that would not logically be it because they're dealing with engines and gasoline and flammables so they didn't want it too close to the building so I think that's obviously going to be um, the manual training school the domestic science school we know where that was it's, it was labeled on the map and this being in the front I would say it would be the band hall is the most logical spot for that because there's another building in the in the works and I'm going to show you that one a little bit later but I believe this is part of the the band hall and athletics now, everybody knows about athletics when it comes to uh, the early school in Northeast Corsicana. This is the earliest picture that I have of uh, an athletic program, which is the baseball team. This baseball team, we know this has to go pre-Douglas because of the insignia, CHS, on the uniforms. So this would be pre-1911. <clears throat> and again, baseball was first. Now, this is information I'd have to get from y'all because obviously I don't, know, uh, <laughs> I don't know what the school colors were back then. I don't know when they were chosen. I know they were purple, and even had my purple tie today for that. But I don't know when they actually started the actual purple and white is the school color. But back then, these uniforms, if they started then, I, they obviously would have been purple. Uh, I don't know when the mascot started either. I don't know when they first adopted the bear, but we do at least have this. So I don't have any early pictures 
of that er early era of football, but I do have this picture of baseball. To let you know where I get some of the other information too, uh, a couple of years ago, I went to Tus Tuskegee University and did a lot of research at the library there. And I plan to go again next summer to go and do some uh, research as well. I did not find any letters at this point between Booker T. Washington and Professor Jackson, but I'm sure they're there. I'm still sifting through a lot of volumes of letters trying to find the letters. I did find one letter, and that was from Edward Earle of the manual training program. He had a letter that he had sent to uh, Booker T. Washington, and I have a copy of that. I'm very proud to have that. So um, as we look on to the next picture, oh, going backwards. This is Fred Douglas as it looked in 1915. It would be near the, the last years. It actually had burned in 1920. So this is one of the final pictures that you see of Fred Douglas. Uh, it's one of the few that has the name. You can actually see the name emblazoned across the doorway. It says Fred Douglas School. And then this, I had to do a little research to find out what this is. This is the graduating class of 1905. The reason I know that, because a book that was written by Professor Jackson, it gives the, the lists and the rosters of every class from uh, 1881 up to 1915. And there's an addendum to that as well, but I know from this era, this has to be the class of 05, because it's the only one that has the uh, male-female ratio and that number, the number of students there. So, uh, I don't know which is which, but I can tell you who these people are. First is Beecher Jackson which would be his son. I can't tell you which one is his son, but one of them is Beecher Jackson. The next one is Roderick Johnson. He's in that picture. John Mullen, Myrtle Chestnut, Adelaide Nelson, and Velma Hardy. They were the graduates of 1905. Of course, that's Professor Jackson there in the middle of them. 